you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule for joining our Pure Light weekend broadcasts. We are so glad this weekend to bring to you another study from the book of Revelation. It's been an amazing series of studies that we studied last week, and we hope and believe that you'll be blessed even this weekend. There's been lots of questions about what is the mark of the beast is COVID-19, the beast, and is getting a vaccine part of the mark of the beast, and what's going on? There's been so many questions surrounding this book of Revelation, so that's why we decided to do a study on it. And uh, today we're going to be looking at this beast. What is this beast that people are talking about its mark? And uh, is there any connection between this and the, mark, I mean, the vaccine and what's going on? And we are not going to try and speculate on this. We're just going to rely on what the Bible teaches about this topic. So as is usually the case, I've decided to do a presentation with you on keynote. So I'm just going to switch over to that now as we go on into our study. And before I do that, let's close our eyes for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the Bible. That is the future all in symbols. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us in our study. For help, help us to understand what we're going to be studying. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're going to talk about uh, the first beast, a study of Revelation chapter 13. A lot of things have been said about this book. Uh, some people believe it's sealed and others believe many things, but... As we have shown in our past series of studies, we have demonstrated clearly that the book of Revelation can actually be understood. And today we're going to be looking at a very interesting um, beast that we find in Revelation chapter 13. And I want to read verse uh, chapter 13, verse, just verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So John here sees a beast, a very interesting beast that is described as having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and it also had the names of blasphemy. Verse 2 says, And the beast was, which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. Quite an interesting description. I guess if you were to meet this kind of animal uh, in the bush, you can't run anyway because it looks like a leopard. It can climb up a tree. You can't even swim because um, both cats, um, I mean, leopards swim, a lion swim, as well as a bear can swim. So there's basically no way to run. It's like a combination of all the predators that you know uh, all combined in this one terrible beast. So there's a lot we're going to learn together on this beast that we want to study uh, from the Bible. And uh, before we even get into this, uh, this beast in the Bible is called the Antichrist. And uh, when you look at the Antichrist in Bible prophecy, is the one who stands in place of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians, I don't have time to read it, but if you read your Bible, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 and 4, you get a picture that the Antichrist is a man who sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is also God. So that is the picture of the Antichrist, trying to take the place of God in God's church. That is the emphasis. And we see that in the book of Revelation 13, are the Antichrist of Bible prophecy counterfeiting on trying to take on the attributes of God. What do we know about God that makes him unique and that makes him stand out? One of the elements that makes God God is creation. Definitely, you know, creating uh, out of nothing man, the earth and everything in it. Um, and also the element of redemption, you know, Jesus Christ dying and resurrecting. That alone can only be done by God. So the Antichrist also tries to counterfeit those elements about God, God's character. And we see that in Revelation chapter 13. How do we see that? We see the Antichrist trying to counterfeit creation. In the beginning, God created man in his own image and likeness, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. In Revelation 13, verse 14, we see a picture of this uh, beast power, basically creating an image after its own likeness, you know, making something out of its own image and likeness. So you have something very similar to what is happening uh, in the book of Genesis, 
Uh, you also see in Genesis 2 verse 7 that after God made man in his own image and likeness, God breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. And that is the picture that you also see right here in the book of Revelation chapter 13. We see a picture of God, I mean the beast's image and is created and this image is just like the beast in its own image and likeness. There's an image and a likeness of the beast and then power is given to this image of the beast to both speak um, and command people. So you have this picture of the image of the beast speaking and commanding people to do something. It's very, very interesting. Um, similar um, a parallel to what we see in the book of Genesis. And uh, it's quite interesting also that after God created man on the sixth day, he basically um, decided to um, give him a Sabbath. After man was created in the image and likeness of God, gave him a Sabbath. And the beast, after creating an image and a likeness to the beast, the image and the likeness of the beast is the one that commands people to keep the mark of the beast. That we'll study uh, uh, a little bit later on in the following weekends. The other thing that we notice about this beast is not only counterfeiting creation, it's also counterfeiting redemption. One of the unique attributes of God's character and his manifestation of his divinity. Uh, Jesus Christ came on this earth. He was given power and authority from the Father. Uh, to be the Messiah and also to be our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. We see uh, the dragon giving this beast power, seed and authority, more like what God did to Jesus. The dragon is doing to the beast power. Um, you also see that Jesus' ministry lasted for about three and a half years, then he died and resurrected. And this beast power is given time to rule on this earth and it also reigns about three and a half prophetic years. More like counterfeiting the ministry of Jesus, the anointing of Jesus, and also his resurrection. Um, we see also the resurrection of Christ. Um, after three and a half years, Christ dies and resurrects. Uh, this beast receives a deadly wound, or a wound that causes death. Um, after three and a half prophetic years of its ministry, um, and then after the resurrection of Jesus, one thing we notice in Philippians 2, is the fact that the Bible says every knee and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So there's this exaltation of Jesus that is clearly manifested after his resurrection. Uh, we see the same thing happening with the beast. After the deadly wound is healed, the Bible says all the world wandered after the beast. So you see that counterfeit of redemption as well as counterfeit of creation. Very quite interesting um, things that the Antichrist power is saying, basically this, I am God, I sit in the temple of God, and I declare myself to be God. The question is, who is so daring enough to be able to claim divinity to that, in, in, to that extent? And we want to study the characteristics, the identifying marks of this beast, um, and it will be so clear, very simple to follow. And before we do that, we need to go into the... Um, Decoding prophetic symbols, which is uh, what do prophecies represent, uh, prophetic symbols represent in each part of the Bible. Well, the Bible is its own textbook, and uh, we're going to be reviewing some of these prophecies that we interpreted in other parts of the Bible. In Bible prophecy, a beast represents a kingdom or a political power. This is what we found in our Daniel series. Daniel 7 verse 17, uh, where the Bible says these four beasts are four kingdoms that shall arise out of the earth. So a beast represents a political power. And this beast is rising up out of the sea, as we notice here, and a sea is representing multitudes of people. Revelation 17 verse 15 tells us that. The waters that thou sowest are multitudes, nations, tongues, and people. So it represents a populated area. And uh, you also have this beast is described as having seven heads. A head in the Bible is a symbol of leadership. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 21 tells us that Christ is the head of the church. Um, and the husband is the head of the wife. So that connotates uh, or implies leadership. You also have horns representing kings. Uh, Daniel 7 24, the ten horns that thou sowest are ten kings that shall arise. And uh, there's also a mention of blasphemy, that this beast has the name of blasphemy on it. 
And uh, what is blasphemy? Well, in John chapter 10, we find a very interesting definition of blasphemy. Jesus made a very interesting claim when he said, I and the Father are one. In other words, claiming divine equal authority with the Father. And uh, that alone is blasphemy. A man who claims to be God. The other one is um, a man who claims to forgive sins. We see that in Mark chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. Jesus Christ forgave somebody's sins and the Jews sought to stone him because uh, they never thought he was divine. They just thought he was a man. So blasphemy is a man who claims to forgive sins. So these are some of the symbols that we have here uh, that we wanted to embark on, uh, or rather to clarify before we get into characteristics. Well, let's go through these characteristics of this beast. Number one, this beast is a religious political power. This beast power, it's a religious political power. Why do we say that? Um, we have discovered that it's classified as a beast that is standing upon the sea and um, the sand of the sea. And uh, he has seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns, ten crowns. So there's a beast here. And we saw that a beast represents political power or a kingdom. Um, it also has the name of blasphemy. Blasphemy is a religious term. So this is a religious political power. It's a power that has religion combined with government. And uh, that's what we see here, identify mark number one. Number two, we see it receives its seed from the dragon. And uh, Revelation 13 verse 2, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So who is this dragon? The dragon in Revelation chapter 12, as we studied last week and the previous weekends with Pastor Apostle, represents Satan primarily, but Satan doesn't just come out. He works through different earthly governments. And the dragon here represents the kingdom of Rome that Satan used, um, that uh, was persecuting Christ and persecuting the church at that particular time. So the second identifier mark is that this kingdom is associated or it derives its authority and power from pagan Rome. The third identifier mark we find in Revelation 13 verse 2 has the characteristics of a lion, bear, leopard, and dragon. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. And his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Leopard, bear, lion. These are very interesting animals because we have seen them before in the book of Daniel. And when we go to the book of Daniel, we find these four interesting beasts. Uh, the first one was like a lion, the second one like a bear, the third one like a leopard. And then there's this terrible beast. Uh, you have those four beasts of Daniel chapter 7. What is very interesting in Revelation 13, it's as if this beast of Revelation 13 is a, uh, a combination of the characteristics of those powers that we have studied in the book of Daniel chapter 7. And one thing that we noted, if we remember from the book of Daniel, is that uh, the lion represented the kingdom of Babylon. And in the kingdom of Babylon, one thing that is very clear it was that they were well known for their idol worship. Idol worship was something very, very prominent in the time of Babylon. And uh, it's quite interesting that this beast is described as having a mouth like a lion. Um, in the Bible, what you speak is a symbol of what's in your heart or a symbol of your character. We find this in Revelation 12 verse 34. I mean, Matthew 12 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So the, if you want to hear and understand somebody's character, you need to listen to them longer. What they speak about most is what they concentrate on and what they think about a lot. And uh, what is going on? What is the mindset behind this terrible beast that we see in Revelation 13? It is the mouth of a lion. And we know that a lion represented the kingdom of Babylon. And Babylon is associated with idol worship. You know, in Daniel chapter 1, the names of the four Hebrew boys were all as symbols of Babylonian gods. In Daniel chapter 2, the Babylonian gods are challenged by God, the God of heaven. We have seen an idol set up in Daniel chapter 3, which everybody needed to worship. And then Daniel chapter 5, they are worshiping the gods of gold, silver, brass, wood, and iron. Uh, we see this idol worship as a prominent part of this particular uh, kingdom of Babylon. But we have to see this. So this particular entity we are studying here 
has to have some a level of idol worship or um, some kind of worshiping of the um, um, sun, the moon, and things like that. And we'll dem demonstrate that a little bit later. The other description of this beast is that it looks like a bear. It has the, uh, the feet of a bear. And uh, the bear represents the kingdom of Middle Persia. And we definitely know the kingdom of Middle Persia by its legal system, its infallible laws that we have. And usually feet and teeth are used by an animal to tear prey and to attack hold and to tear to pieces. So this kingdom uses something that the Bible describes and compares to a bear to basically um, put everything under its control and leadership and rulership. Um, so the Medes and the Persians were well known for their unchangeable laws. Daniel 6 verse 8, Now O king established the decree and signed the writing that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not. So we see here an unchangeable law of the Medes and Persians. You go to the book of Ezra, which is still the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. There's the laws about rebuilding the temple, restoration of Jerusalem. You have that in the book of Esther, the same thing, laws about the destruction of the Jews. You go to the book of Nehemiah, you find the same element. So the kingdom of Middle Persia was associated with laws that could not be changed. So we are going to find that this beast power was using laws, unchangeable laws. So the concept of infallibility to try and gain control of the world and hold it under its paws. Uh, that's what we see here. The bodies of a leopard. And leopard is associated with the kingdom of Greece. And Greece was well known for its philosophy and humanism, uh, principles of humanism. We read that in the Bible. Um, in Acts 17, 21, speaking about the Athenians and the Greeks. It says, and all the Athenians and the strangers which were there spend their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear something new. You know, they're very curious people that wanted to always learn something new. And in 1 Corinthians 1.22, the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, Greek wisdom, philosophy, is something that the Greeks are well known for uh, globally, for their uh, establishment of an education system that is still prevalent even in our time. So we have this, a philosophy uh, that is behind the system as well. And then this beast also gains its power from the dragon. Uh, the dragon we saw represented pagan Rome. Uh, dragon, pagan Rome was well known for its persecution of God's people uh, over centuries of time. Um, if you study the Bible, you will discover that uh, pagan Rome was well known for persecution. Even in Revelation 12 verse 4, a dragon is described as trying to kill the man-child that is born. In Romans 7, Daniel 7, 7, Rome is described, the beast of all beast, as devouring, breaking down, and stamping under feet its uh, residue. And Daniel 8, 10, Rome is described as casting the saints and stamping upon them. Uh, the Romans are the ones that killed Jesus. Rome was the one that was responsible for the persecution of the apostles and uh, of the early Christian church. So what is mostly prominently emphasized about Rome is this element of persecution. So what are we saying about this particular beast power? It's a religious political power, number one. Number two, it receives its seed from the dragon, uh, which is pagan Rome. Number three, has the characteristics of a lion, bear, and leopard. What is the meaning of that? Uh, this system promotes idolatry and sun worship um, from Babylon. It promotes the concept of infallibility from Middle Persia. It promotes humanism through philosophy from the Greeks. And it promotes and justifies persecution of God's people that is from pagan Rome. Uh, we are still going to make it very simple uh, so that you'll be able to follow through this. Number four, identify mark number four. This beast power is described as blaspheming God, his sanctuary, and angels in heaven. And um, so this beast power is described as blaspheming God. So what is this blasphemy? We talked a little bit about this, but I want to emphasize these verses that we talked about. There are three definitions of blasphemy in the Bible. The first one is a man who claims to be God. 
If I'm a man and I claim to be God, I'm blaspheming God. The second one is a man who claims to forgive sin. That is what we find in Mark chapter 2 verse 5 to 7. The third one is a man who claims to be a Christian but is not. Um, um, so this is the Antichrist power. That is blasphemy. So we're expecting the Antichrist to claim to be God. We're expecting him to claim to forgive sins. And we're expecting him to claim to be a Christian when he, in actual fact he's not. Uh, the Bible tells us that he's sitting in the temple of God, uh, showing himself that he's God. He will do everything that God does. God forgives sin, he will do it as well. He claims to be God on earth. And also this is a reference to an establishment of a system of priests and on earth and also the confessionals. That, um, that's what we see here uh, on this particular element. Then it gets very interesting, Revelation 13, verse 7. It says, in verse 7 I read, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints, and to overcome them. And power is given him over all the kindreds, and tongues, and nations. So this beast power is described as making war with the saints, persecuting Christians. Uh, that is what we see here. That is identifying mark number five. It has to be a persecuting power. Number six, um, it's given time to persecute. The Bible tells us that it's going to persecute Christians um, for about 42 months. That's verse five. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy. And power is given unto him to continue 42 months. So you have this 42 months of persecution of Christians as well as ruling for 42 months. That is what is very interesting. What are these 42 months? Well, if you go to the book of Revelation chapter 11, and uh, we're going to look at verse 2 and 3. It says, But the court which is without the temple live out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot 42 months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. You may not understand the details of this, but um, one thing that is very interesting in this verse is you have 42 months um, equated to 1,260 days. That's what we see there. And, um, and how do you get that also? The other way of getting that is that a month in Bible prophecy has 30 days. So you have 42 months by 30 and you get 1,260 days. And uh, if you go to Numbers 14.34 as well as Ezekiel 4.6, you get a picture of um, the Bible saying one prophetic day equals to one literal year. One prophetic day equals to one literal year. So 1,260 prophetic days would be equal to 1,260 literal years. What does that mean? It means that this beast power was going to rule the world for 1,260 years. We're given the duration uh, upon which this beast power is going to rule the world. So if persecutes Christians, it's going to reign in the world for 1,260 years. After 1,260 years, what will happen to this beast power? Revelation chapter 13 verse um, 10 says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. There's a picture here of he that led into captivity. Who is he that was led into captivity? The same power. It captured God's people, persecuted them. What will happen to it? It will also be captured, and that capturing of this beast power is described in Revelation 13 verse 3 as a deadly wound that this beast receives. Revelation 13 3, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. So those are the identifying mark. It receives a deadly wound. It implies that it loses its political power. Um, and um, it's killed with a sword. That's what we see here. Led into, into captivity. It's also being led into captivity. After it was led into captivity, the uh, faces of this uh, deadly wound. Being led in captivity is a reference to this beast power receiving a deadly wound. 
And what is this deadly wound? Well, we have three faces of the deadly wound that we see here in Revelation 13. Verse 14 speaks about um, the wound being healed. It receives a wound by a sword. Uh, chapter 13 verse 14 speaks about receiving this deadly wound by a sword. Um, the wound is healed and all the world wandered after the beast. Um, because the beast used the sword to kill, it was also going to, the sword was going to be used to inflict pain on this. And uh, the sword there is a symbol of the government, um, civil power, that was the one that was used to persecute God's people. It was the same civil power that was also used to separate this beast power. Um, into from um, from being a union of church and state to being a separation of church and state. Then the Bible tells us that this deadly wound is going to be healed. And when the deadly wound is healed, there's now a unity of church and state together. That is what we see according to this. Now, who does this beast power then represent? Well, before I get into the interpretation of this, I want to share with you that this is not just a study of us Seventh-day Adventists. This is a result of a study for Protestants, reformers, uh, from many, many years of study. Uh, we discover that uh, people like Martin Luther, the founder of the Lutheran Church, made this conclusion after studying it. He says, we are of the conviction that the papacy is the seat of the real Antichrist. After Martin Luther, who was an, actually a Catholic of the Augustinian monk rank, he concluded that, oh, the church that I belong to is the Antichrist or Bible prophecy. He studied Revelation 13. He studied the book of Daniel. He studied 2 Thessalonians and many other parts of the Bible. And he same reached the conclusion that this beast power represents none other than the Antichrist or Bible prophecy who is the papacy. Very, very interesting uh, that you have that. The other one that is quite interesting is... Um, um, what John Calvin, the founder of the major evangelical community, the Calvinists, um, he also reached the same conclusion. In John Calvin tracts, he says, I deny him to be the vicar of Christ. He is Antichrist. I deny him to be the uh, head of the church. So John Calvin declared that uh, the papacy is not the head of the church. He is, in actual fact, uh, the Antichrist, the big evangelical community following Calvin. Um, need to understand that Calvin reached this conclusion after allowing the Bible to give him the identifier marks, and then he went into that to basically find out what the truth is. These were not the only men. You know, you have John Knox, a very significant Protestant reformer as well. He said that tyrant which the Pope himself had for so many years exercised over the church, the very Antichrist and sudden perdition of whom Paul speaks. John Knox also concluded that the papacy is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. And all these Protestant reformers used to be Catholics. They were not just like Catholic bashing just for the sake of it. They were trained in Catholic theological seminaries. And they reached the conclusion that they reached based on their simple study of the Bible. But why would they say that? Why would they say that? What would be the reason? Well, let's look at the identifier marks again. And we're going to follow them, and we will see how history fulfills that. Uh, this is a religious political power. We saw that. Um, it also receives its seed from the dragon, um, which is pagan Rome. Did the papers who receive its seed from pagan Rome? Is the papers who really um, a unity of church and state? Well, we're going to let history explain that to us. Um, in a book, Cardinal uh, Conrad Eckhart, The Papacy and the World Affairs, uh, page 1, he says, Under the Roman Empire, the popes had no temporal power. But when the Roman Empire had disintegrated, its place had been taken by a number of rude barbarous kingdoms. The Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of that state in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. So the papacy definitely from this statement took over from the Roman Empire and also started dominating both secular and religious elements of society, which is a reference to uh, church and state. He was the one controlling all that. What is also very interesting is a statement that uh, Stanley's Church History, page 40, says the popes filled the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, 
prestige and titles from paganism. Uh, the papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. So the papacy did indeed come from, uh, it was given power by Rome and it also became a religious political power based on history. That is what history tells us exactly what is going on. The other third one is that it is the characteristics of a bear, leopard, and all those. There's this concept of infallibility um, and uh, many other things. You know, concept of infallibility, sun worship, humanism and philosophy, persecution of Christians. And uh, did these things happen within the Catholic Church or not? Well, let's go into the element of sun worship or, or Sunday worship. Um, this is the covered catechism of the Catholic doctrine by Reverend Peter Heinemann. Um, he says something quite interesting. Which day is the Sabbath? The question is asked. And the answer that is given is Saturday is the Sabbath. That is what they give you. And then it says, um, the, the next question asked was, why, why do we observe Sunday then instead of the Sabbath? The answer that is given is because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. That is the reason uh, that is given for that. And uh, we see that Sunday was also an institution of the Catholic Church. It was the Catholic Church that decided that Sunday, Sunday should be the day of worship for Christians in honor of the resurrection. This is Carl Kittering, Kittering um, um, in Catholicism and Fundamentalism. That is what we find right here. The other thing that we notice uh, from our study is that it has this concept of infallibility or unchangeable decrees uh, that were given in official capacity. Well, if you look up in the Britannica, the concept of papal infallibility, this is what you get. Uh, papal infallibility in Roman Catholic theology, the doctrine that the Pope, acting as supreme teacher and under certain conditions, cannot err when he teaches in matters of faith or doctrine. Quite interesting statement of the infallibility of um, the Pope when he speaks ecta cadra. Um, and then there's also an element of promoting philosophy. Um, and also persecution. Did the Catholic Church persecute God's people? The church has persecuted. Only a tyro in church history will deny that. We've always defended the persecution of the Huguenots and the Spanish Inquisitions. When she thinks it good to use physical force, she will use it. The Western Watchmen, December 24, 1909. The Catholic Church has persecuted uh, many, many Christians. Some of the most prominent persecutions um, this 1572 St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, on which many, many Protestants were called, and they were killed in many, many large numbers by uh, an arrangement of the Catholic Church. Fox's Book of Martyrs documents a series of many persecutions that happened under the reign of the Catholic Church, where many Christians were burnt, others were you know, the wreck was used to kill them. Others were burnt at the stake. Uh, there were many methods that were used to torture and kill Christians during the Dark Ages. To a, such a point that in 2000, uh, Time magazine of March 12 released a very interesting article in which the Pope actually was making confession, uh, trying to appeal for people to basically um, forgive him for forgive the Catholic Church for the things that they had done to them. Um, and it says, In the Jubilee year and the season of the Lent, Pope John Paul II confronts the Crusades, the Inquisition of the Holocaust, and other horrors in seeking to express regret for the sins committed by the Catholics in the past 2,000 years. So um, the Pope even admitted that there were major, major um, Christian persecution that took place um, in the last 2,000 years that were initiated by the Catholic Church. Um, this power blasphemes God, his sanctuary, and angels in heaven. That is what we saw in our identifying mark, and is that fulfilled? We saw that blasphemy is claiming to be God, claiming to forgive sin. Well, let's ask the Catholics a question. Does the priest truly forgive the sins, or does, the, does he only declare that they are remitted? Uh, the answer that is given is the priest does in really and truly forgive the sin 
in virtue of the power given to him by Christ. This is Joseph de Habe, a complete catechism of the Catholic Church. So what are they saying? If you go to the confessionals and you ask for forgiveness, the priest does in actual fact forgive your sin. And in the biblical definition of blasphemy, that definitely qualifies as blasphemy. The other one that is quite interesting is um, uh, encyclical letters of Pope Leo XIII, page 304. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That is what we see here. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, claiming to be God on earth. The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ, himself hidden under the veil of flesh. Catholics National July 1895. They are basically saying, I am God on earth. And um, that is what we see. We are about to finish. But um, did the Catholic Church persecute? We covered that. Did the Catholic Church rule for 1,260 years? Yes, it did. Well, let's look at the history. History of the rise in the spirit of rationalism in Europe. It says, um, the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. Will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. This institution has killed more people than Hitler during the Holocaust of the Jews. Has killed more people than what we see in World War I, World War II. This is the institution that has killed many more people than any other institution in the history of our planet. And uh, as we'll see in other future presentations, it's also going to kill more. Um, that is what we see here. Did it rule for 1,260 years? Yes, it did. It did rule. From 538 AD, um, the Ostrogoths, the last Aryan kingdoms to oppose the Roman church, were overthrown in the year 538 AD. And Justinian um, gave political power to the Pope um, in 538 AD. And for the very first time, the Catholic Church and um, joined together with the government. So there was unity of church and state right there. And in 1798, there was separation of church and state that took place when Napoleon's general, Bethia, captured Pope Pius VI. And 1260 years passed after that, and Napoleon's general broke the Roman church political power in the year 1798, inflicting a deadly wound on the Catholic Church. And uh, that is what we see right here. The deadly wound uh, was received when political power was taken away uh, from this particular power. In 1798, the Encyclopedia Americana, 1941 edition, says, He, Bethia, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. Um, we see that Encyclopedia uh, that the Catholic Church was literally abolished and there was no other power um, um, that existed as, uh, it never existed now as a government. It only existed as a church. What is the conclusion we are reaching? The first piece of Revelation chapter 13 represents no other power other than the Catholic uh, Church or the papacy. And we are not attacking individuals. We are identifying the system which Catholics like Martin Luther and many others who follow the law were led to the same conclusions as others. If you study the Bible, there's about more than 80 different identifying marks of this beast power so that you cannot make mistake. I just chose a few so that you can easily follow. We have seen, my friends, a conclusion that is inevitable. No wonder um, John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, reached this conclusion. He concluded that the Roman papacy is Antichrist, in an infantical sense, the man of sin. Um, this conclusion, uh, this is from John Wesley, Antichrist and his Ten Kingdoms, page 110. These conclusions were reached by a man who went to the Bible to try and find out who is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. And um, as we study these things, we are seeing the beginning of the fulfillment of some of these things, my friends, uh, before our very eyes. The regard with which uh, many people treat the papacy and the respect they give him 
And even the recent climate change uh, meeting in which the Pope's encyclical Laudato Si has received so much um, attention, um, uh, also the you know, re-emphasis of the climate uh, Paris um, agreement, and the governments of the world all agreeing and the religions of the world all coming together, we are beginning to see the restoration of the healing of this deadly wound, that it's time to us to seek the Lord. Revelation 13 verse 8 tells us that there are some people who are going to escape what is coming upon this earth. And uh, the condition that is given in Revelation 13 verse 8 is quite interesting. It says in verse 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Are you dwelling on earth? If your name is not written in the Lamb's book of the Lamb, you are going to worship this beast power. It's just a matter of time. With the lockdown, we are getting into a society that is uh, beginning to move into soft totalitarianism. And that is a uh, world global authority is being implemented and our rights are being taken away. We are about to see the unfolding of this system in an amazing and shocking manner. It's time to seek the Lord and ensure that your name gets written in the book, uh, the Lamb's Book of Life. May God bless you and thank you so much for watching. Let us close our eyes for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible that has revealed many things to our ears and to our minds that we never thought of, we never knew about. And uh, some of us knew these things, but we need to be reminded them uh, of them with time. May you bless us, may you guide us, may you strengthen us with your mighty hand and your power. And uh, give us a wonderful Sabbath. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.